We don't usually do intros to shows, but I thought it was quite interesting to point out in this interview with uh, Girls School's uh, Kim McAuliffe that a simple yes or no decision can alter our lives and history as we know it, and in this case, metal history. Let's go back to 1982. Our producer, Spencer Proffer, was looking for a band to record Come On, Feel the Noise, which was written by Slade and was a number one hit in the UK. He wanted to get that same success in America. So he asked the then popular group Girl School to come to LA so he can produce their next album. And in the same time frame, he asked Quiet Right, a unknown band at the time as well, saying that Kevin Dubrow's voice was very similar to uh, Naughty Holders of Slade. So Quiet Right said yes, and Girl School said no. Would history have been altered if Girl School said yes? If Girl School would have said yes, would Spencer Prophet Proffer not recorded with Quiet Riot? Or delayed working with Quiet Riot? I mean, timing is everything, right? If Girl School said yes, maybe they would have had success the same way Quiet Riot did. Or maybe the song Come On Feel The Noise, or any other song for that matter, would have not hit the billboard, would have not sold 500,000. Maybe mental health would not have been number one. And if mental health did not go number one on billboard, then maybe that whole metal movement just would have never happened or would have been delayed for that matter. Metal history may have been altered completely. Here's the interview. Welcome back to The Metal Voice. Yeah. Kim McAuliffe from uh, Girls School. We just saw her recently on the tour with uh, Lillian Ax and Alcatraz in Canada. But the tour continues. The last U.S. or let's say North American tour, the last time Girls School will be in North America. That's that. The end. That's that. Well, 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 apparently, yeah, because basically it's so difficult for us to get there. I mean, not only us, but most for a lot of bands, you know, because it's just it, ugh, with the visas, the cost of those and like the appointments and the, everything you have to. It just takes forever and it costs a bloody fortune. <laughs> so, you know, it's before, just uh, before we get into the questions, we're going to I'm going to just spell out the uh, the tour dates. Yeah. October 16th is in yeah. Dallas, Austin. Austin, then Portland, then you're going up to Vancouver on the West Coast in Canada, going down to yeah. San Francisco, Los Angeles, and then Phoenix, but there might be some more dates added, correct? Um, I think, no, for us, it finishes on the 5th of November. Okay, all right. Uh, whether go. they fill in a couple of the off days, I hope not, because we got so many thousands of miles to drive, it's, it'd be virtually impossible. You know? All right. So, yeah. well, we... Stefan? Okay. Yeah, uh, it was uh, like I said when I saw you uh, a couple of months ago at Le Fufun, uh I always brought me back to the fact not only of the fact you were pioneering but to the fact you're still attracting yeah. a, a, a considerable fan base that yeah. dates back to the early 80s from your first passage and now uh, it's what 43 years uh, since her first tour of North America. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm curious to know, uh, now that you've decided to sort of slow down considerably and, and leave North America, all those... We, we don't travel... want to. I like to... We don't want to. It just, it, it's becoming impossible. That's yeah. All. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. All those travels for a... Uh, for, a women's group that brought you on every continent, every country in the world. <clears throat> what is your most memorable trip, your most memorable tour in all those years? 
Wow. Um, do you know, I do get asked, asked this quite a lot. And, um, and I, after 46 years, or it's going to be 47 next time, oh, oh, God, whatever. it's really difficult. But obviously, probably the most memorable is it's got to be the first one with Motorhead because that was the first time that we actually played a proper tour as opposed to you know, rock clubs and stuff. So for the most memorable, yeah. And then I think I've really got to say, go on 40 years later, the next one had got to be the final, Lemmy's final tour, because we were then playing to just, I mean, massive, you know, arenas. And um, I, I felt so, you know, well, we were honoured and so proud to be with Lemmy on his last tour. And the fact that they would got to that stage, they were just huge, you know. So we were on their first, very first British tour, ma major tour, and then we were on their last one, you know. So... But then apart from that, of course, the first time, well, first time, the only time we um, headlined Reading Festival, we're still the only female band to do that. And um, being invited by Richie to um, support them on the Deep Purple reunion tour in America. Um, oh, I, you know, I, I just, it's difficult. How do you feel about uh, North American sort of disengagement from metal for a long time i mean there's the revival it seems took a lot more time to happen compared to europe for example i did right. see you at heavy montreal and events like this oh I, with most head and kiss was that yeah yeah <laughs> i'm under the impression that uh north america as a rule has always been harder you know, once the 80s European metal wave went through, there's always a market that was tougher to recapture. What were you able to sort of associate it with? What do you think the reason is for that? Uh, well, the funny thing about um, heavy metal, it seems to me, is it goes out of fashion a little bit, no matter where you are in the world, in different, and then it comes back again. And it, but the, the true fact is, it's always been there. It's always been there. It just so every now and again, it sort of comes right up to the the fore again, and it becomes the new big thing again. You know, and I'm thinking, hang on a minute, I've loved this for like nearly fifty years. You know, so you know, people are a bit late to the party. I think sometimes, but uh, you know, I, I mean, who knows? I mean, things sort of turn. They, they, you know, they come and go, and then they come back again, and it's just, you know, I, I, I just think America, obviously, I mean, they were, America was exactly when I keep thinking about that. I mean, they were the first big rock bands, weren't they, to, you know, break America, you know, even like all those years ago. So it's, it's difficult to say, you know. Jim, not only was girls, I, I believe you guys might even have the world record for the longest running all girl band, uh, at least well, in metal, in the metal category, right? But yeah. you're also the first all-female metal band to play Russia with Black Sabbath, the Tony Martin era, correct? Yes, yes. What so, sort that was. Yeah. And tell us about that because I interviewed yeah. Tony a yeah. while back, not too long ago, and he said, Girl School really got it on stage where yeah. they were throwing yeah. stuff at I you. Remember, I think you told me that when I met you last time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, you tell you me, tell me about yeah. it now, but you tell me about it, what yeah. happened. <laughs> Yeah, well, the, oh, well, here we go again. Oh, I, I've got to go back to um, the biggest um, yeah, gigs again and tours and everything. Of course, one of the biggest ones was, and I'm not just saying this, the first time we came to Canada. That was like, because we'd gone gold in, in, you know, in Canada. So that was the first time we'd ever gone anywhere, you know, like, th like that, like you, like, you know, over there. So that was really exciting as well. And, um, you know, it's just... Uh, Anyway, that's but there's so many others. But anyway, I'll, I'll, I keep thinking of things every time you say, mm -hmm. okay, "Oh my God, then there was that time, mm -hmm. then there was that time." But anyway, I'll get mm -hmm. back to, I'll get, I'll go, I'll get back to uh, that. But um, the weirdest thing is, well, the greatest, one of the greatest things for me is that, especially with the Deep Purple thing and the Black Sabbath thing, was they were the one, they were literally the first two bands that I saw at Hammersmith Odeon when I was sixteen. You know, so I just. The fact that then, little did I know that only a few years later, we'd be playing with Black Sabbath for three nights, 
supporting them and having have a safe out in. I was only 16, and so by the time I was 19, I was literally, you know, playing with them there. And that was that was the, the you know the Dio area era era. And uh, anyway, so for some reason over the years, we always seem to be touring whatever uh, lineup Black Sabbath had at that point in time. We always seem to be playing with them. God knows where in the world, but you know it's like. I mean, we played with them when Ian Gillan was singing with them, you know. So that was very strange. And was it Bev Bevan on drums? And you know, yeah, so uh, we. But the weirdest thing is, we've never actually played with them with Ozzy. So that's quite. Yeah, you know, I'd love to have done that because that would have made the full set then. <laughs> so over the years, but then of course what happened was we got offered this tour with them in Russia. And it just sounded incredible. We had 10 days in Moscow and 10 days in Leningrad in this massive, you know, these massive arenas. And that was just, you know, it was an incredible experience. You know, so, yeah. And uh, and a great lineup, obviously, because you had Cozy. Tony was excellent. And, of course, our, our great old mate, Neil Murray. And Jeff on keyboards, bless him. And, uh, and obviously, Tony. So, yeah. Oh, I think he knows what he's saying. But, yeah, that was the time. I remember one time with Deep Purple as well. Um, no, hang on, the Rainbow Tour in Europe. People were chucking fireworks and chucking everything. And Richie went nuts. And he said, that's it. We, if you throw anything more. I think that was the era of things when people seemed to think it was okay to chuck things. That's at right. Well, but, I, yeah. I, I grew up uh, on the metal scene, rock scene, concert scene in those days. And they were different. In a sense, yeah. that teenagers going to concerts 40, 45 years ago were going for the music, but were also going to get excessively drunk and rebellious yeah. and throw things. Yeah. Now, when they yeah. pay $200 a ticket, they think twice yeah. about ruining the reason. <laughs> yeah, but, too right and all, that's what I say. <laughs> but I did... Uh, uh, preparing for this morning, I did find a piece. Um, I, I, I happened to keep most of my concert tickets and scrapbooks, and okay. look what I found. Uh, these are the tickets for your whoops. Push it like in mid mid range, mid range maybe. Yeah, it's blurring. Uh, yeah. For your yeah. first yeah. two shows at the Montreal Club Montreal, uh, yeah. it was. June 18th and June 19th, you had about a thousand people each night. Wow. I liked the first night so much that I bought a ticket for the second night. <laughs> I was leaning against the stage right in front of you. Yeah. And that little thing there is a guitar pick that you handed to me at the very end of the show. Oh, wow. And the date was... Um, Hold on here. The date was 18th and 19th of June, 1981. Wow, we were busy that year, that's for sure. Yeah, <laughs> and if you look at the ticket right under June 22nd, 1981, the very same venue, but just one night. It's still oh. up and coming band called Iron Maiden. Ah, uh -huh. yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. But just yeah. to just to embarrass you, I was oh. 14 years old and got in oh, with Quick ID. And the very same day you went to a local record store to yeah. sign autographs to fans. And here's fine. There it is. There it is. Yeah. See, oh look, this is bad. I'm having to take my shades off. Got no makeup or anything, but never mind. <laughs> okay. I can't see anything otherwise. <laughs> but wow. Yeah, that was a busy year, of course, because that's when we had hit and run out. And, um, yeah. And, of course, <laughs> like, oh, again, here we go again about the memorable things. Uh, I've got to also mention, of course, the I Ma the Scorpions I made and tore on us. I mean, that that went on for just over three months. You know, So that was the first time we did anything, you know, that long. That and, was a uh, blackout slash uh, Number of the Beast tour, right? That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I tell you what, when 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 I'm just sorry, but when I got home, my mum and dad had put all balloons up and everything, saying "Welcome home." And I just got into my flat and I burst into tears. <laughs> I was just so relieved to be home. <laughs> yeah, remember that really, but yeah. In yeah. the early '80s, uh, well, 
women groups were treated very differently compared to today. Today, metal bands or the female singer get treated with a lot of respect. And yeah. my recollection of the early 80s is that you faced an awful lot of sexism and misogyny. Uh, did you feel a point in your career where that no longer became an issue and you were just mm -hmm. considered metalheads and that's yeah. it? Well, you know, I think we're probably so thick-skinned that we really didn't care. You know, <laughs> it's like we didn't, we didn't care. Um, and uh, people often say to us, well, would you, would you, um, you know, put down to your longevity and all the rest of it, how, how, how have you managed to carry on so long? And we always say um, stubbornness and stupidity, you know. So, I mean, it's just like we, didn't, we were, honestly didn't care. We didn't think about it. And... The best thing is that all the bands we played with, all the male bands, at least to our faces anyway, um, we got them like a house on fire. They just treated us like one of the boys. So, um, you know, we had no reason to feel, you know, I don't know, anything except sort of, you know, wanted. So it, it was, we didn't really honestly find that much um, misogyny or anything. Which is quite surprising, really. It, a few times, obviously, when we first started out, they used to go, get them off, get your tits out, whatever. We used to say, you bloody get them off. We're not bloody getting them off, you know. <laughs> it's like, sodger. So we didn't, like, it, again, you know, it, it didn't bother us too much. Oh, and people used to go on about us, like, what do you think of Rainbow's song, like, all night long and all the rest of it. And we thought it was bloody brilliant. We just loved it. It's just, you know, it's just a song. And, uh, yeah. And are, are, we've written a few of them like that ourselves, so we can't really complain. <laughs> are there like a lot of bands face these fork in the roads in their career where you know they yeah. choose path A, everything's great, or they chose path B and things didn't turn out the way they wanted it to be? Were there any sort of career choices you would you regret back in the early days? Well, yeah, of course, or not. Well, yeah. there is one sort of big one, but I don't really regret it because I wouldn't be where I am right here now, sitting you know, in my, where I love to live, you know, whatever. And that was the fact that we got, we got a choice. We could either, this was for our fourth album, which ended up to be Play Dirty. We had a choice that we could either go to America, to LA and record with Spencer Proffer or stay in London and record with our heroes, which of course was Jim and Nod from Slade. And think, you know, I mean, we, we just wanted to, you know, record with our heroes and stay in London. And funny enough, because we were a British band, and of course now it turns out that possibly if we'd gone to America, we would have sounded more like the British band than if we'd stayed here. So who knows? You know? yeah. So I guess yeah. he, he asked you before Quiet Right or Quiet yeah. Right, like you said, right? Yeah, yeah, we turned it down. I mean, that, what, what were we like? <laughs> but, uh, yeah. But you did record not uh, Slade, you know, High and Dry. It was a very... Decent song. I loved it. I yeah. mean, as far as I'm concerned, much better than quite anything quite right ever yeah. put out. Oh, cheers, thanks. Yeah. Well, but, that, again, um, Jim and Nod are brilliant songwriters, you know, and we had such fun. We had such a blast with them. And just the fact that we were able to work with them and got to know them sort of pretty well, that was enough for me, you know. So, yeah. But whatever might have been. It didn't happen, so there's no point in thinking about it. But what we did have was a truly amazing experience. So. Things I I have uh, I remember the album uh, Running Wild very well, yeah. uh, which had some fantastic songs. But things got a bit funny around Nightmare at Maple Cross. I remember how hard it was in North America to get a copy. Um, yeah. Did you sense that things were starting to maybe get off the tracks by then? Well, the funny thing is, we did we recorded Nightmare at Maple Cross after Running Wild, so we were going back to our roots and we went back to Vic Mail. So yeah. that was more us, yeah, than anything else. But of course, we didn't have the record company to back us like the other ones, so it was only a smaller record company by our management, you know. So even though that that was I, I really like that that album because it just that was us going back to a four piece and going back to our roots and back to thick mail so yeah 
Because I do recall that uh, when uh, bronze went belly up, the the ripples in the metal yeah. scene uh, lasted years. The rights yeah. for these albums and all those great bands no longer having a record company. I remember Lemmy yeah. losing tons of money in there. And uh, it, it probably showed how fragile the ecosystem yeah of the metal scene could be despite the success of some of its uh artists yeah well <clears throat> this is the thing um uh, because basically even these days now we don't know who owns our back catalog we haven't got a clue i mean that keeps changing all the time it's like someone's got it now i think bmg have got it now or universal or whatever they're bloody called i can't keep up but They've got most of the old heavy metal back catalogue, you know, from all different bands. Um, so, yeah, I mean, obviously everything's out of our control. We were just young, you know, and we just, we had our manager, obviously Doug Smith, and we used to just do whatever, you know, because you put your faith in your manager and your record company. And we were just having too good a time to even think about what might happen in the future, you know. So what can you do? Going back to those early albums, the first four, did you... Did you pass the red line on them? Did do you still see some income from them today, or is it just someone's got them somewhere and yeah, oh, <laughs> someone's, no, someone's making money? Them. Yeah, someone's got them somewhere. That's you, for sure. You, That's are, why are, we 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 yeah, actually re we re recorded Hit and Run for its anniversary so that we could sort of reclaim it back for ourselves. Yes. Okay. So yes, we make money from that, um, but actually there, there's negotiations going on at the moment that we might possibly be able to get. Okay, get something good. back you know so that'd be nice for my, for my retirement <laughs> because it is a shame that the early albums uh apart from uh, screaming blue murder and uh, and play dirty are just impossible to find in any format you can't even stream them and that must be right. very frustrating for an artist who needs to make sure their music yeah transcends generations and it's passed on to generations yeah i know it's just it's mad really because you know you just don't think about that obviously when you're young and we probably should have taken more interest in our career and what would have happened in the future but obviously we didn't and we're, we're you know we're here where we are now and there's no point in having regrets or looking back we just have to go forward you see i have the box set of the first four right oh yeah that's right yeah see they and put, you can I mean, buy we, we, this i don't know if you're getting yeah. paid for this that's another no, story. of course not of course not right? that's a shame <laughs> right that's a real shame yeah do you know a lot yeah. of people they go oh yeah we got do you know you well i they keep putting stuff out and we go they go oh you know you've got this coming out we go no <laughs> but, but having but said that they can manager, buy this one they can buy this yes one. What's and the 45? We got the fantastic, yeah, we got the fantastic new out, um, new record and I, company. And it's just as yeah. good as the old ones. So there you ah, go. They can brilliant. buy this one. You'll get No, some very time. much agree. Very much agree on that. We certainly never yeah. compromised on quality and style, even though you yeah. were pulled in many ways during the 80s. But now that you've been able, since uh, Maple Grove, to stick to your guns to what you enjoy playing was it yeah. easier to sort of a make a decent living and b stay in touch with a strong fan base that carried you through these years uh well basically yeah we we make a living through you know we do get royalties and stuff obviously from prs and mcp you know there, there's lots of income coming in through there just not the record sales basically and obviously playing all the rest of it um, but yeah, I've got to mention, you haven't mentioned the album Legacy. Have you heard of that album? Legacy was in 2008. I don't have a copy oh. of it here, but it uh, was the year you played. It was, yeah, it was the year you played Heavy MTL. So it makes right. sense. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. You were touring behind that album. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that was our really big comeback, you know, with the Silver Lining and all those, you know, SPV and record companies there um, to get back to what we really love doing after a little bit of a break, you know, so, um, and we haven't looked back since then. Well, I say haven't looked back. It took us, it, it took us eight years to get this new one out. <laughs> but, yeah. Here's a little bit of a plug. There you go. Pick it up. Yay. 
That's great great album. Thank you. Great, That's great right. album. I Thank hope you. everybody That's got it. Um, another question I wanted to uh, attach to this is, um, of course, festivals are very important in the career of a band. And this is where usually you get in touch with a younger, different audience. Yeah. Um, how does it feel when you find that in the front rows at the festival, you have people extremely young who yeah. were obviously not born in the 80s or even 90s? Uh, yeah. Think of my own daughter, who is 30 years old and, and listens yeah. to your music. And I asked myself, what goes through your mind when you see these kids and say, Jesus Christ, they were not <laughs> born in 1980. Yeah. yeah. Well, I know it's quite amazing, isn't it? Because sometimes we, we meet people um, and they weren't even born, you know, obviously when we were around or when we recorded these albums. But a lot of time it's like, oh, my mum and dad got, got me into you and stuff like that. And but it's it's lovely, really. And especially when you get the little babies down the front with their little ear, ear defender things, when they're going their push chairs and all the rest of it, it's, it's quite amazing, really. Yeah, and you've got sometimes there's three generations of a family, you know. I mean, having said all that, of course, our new bass player Olivia, she wasn't around when we when we you know she wasn't even born when we recorded Hit and Run. She's so you know we go oh my god it's so bizarre. So yeah. Or demolition or any room, yeah. So there you go. But uh, so I don't know, age is just something that just, just happens, doesn't it? So there, nothing you can do about it. There was also the tour, Lock Up Your Sons tour with the head pins in Canada. Oh, There's always, yeah. you know, tell me a little bit about that and how did that, and back then, you know, saying a, a phrase like that, you know, going yeah. out on tour, a bunch of women on tour. Yeah. It's kind well, of I think that must have been because obviously we didn't come up with that. That was obviously the publicity people, you know. I suppose that was a play on "Look up your daughters" or something from my maiden, you know. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, well, the the main one I remember with um, the Canada tour was with Anvil, our great mates Anvil. I remember a lot, lot more with that, you know. So, but don't forget, it was a long time ago. So, the the brains I've lost a few brain cells since then. What, what was the connection with Canada? Why do you think Canadians? grasp you know what uh, girl school or embraced girl school a lot yeah. easier well, i don't know perhaps we're way. perhaps we're a bit more the same you know so yeah in attitudes and things possibly but uh i don't know it's who knows who knows did you ever I think mean, did you ever think of writing your biography oh god oh, no. yeah <laughs> i've been asked loads of times and one thing I always said was I'd, I'd never even think about it while my mum and dad were still alive. I just, I couldn't do that to them. <laughs> but now, sadly, I lost, well, my dad, I lost him years ago, but I lost my mum two years ago. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's, it's possible that, it's possible that, yeah. Yeah, I think it was like a couple of weeks ago that she died. But, and, oh, sorry, what took that? It was on Sunday, because then I had to go to a funeral, actually, on Monday, to my cousin. So, of course, we I went there the day before and we were, celebrate my mum and my cousin so ugh. anyway getting old sucks sometimes <laughs> you, you know, girl school has always been opening for the biggest bands in hard rock yeah. and metal deep purple rainbow yeah. um iron maiden scorpions but also rush oh i know that was the weirdest one because well, um, why, why do you think that happened why, i would never how, know how you don't know how it happened? They just gave you a call one day, said, you're going on tour with yeah, Rush. This was exit stage, stage left. Said, yeah, yeah. And I still remember, it's one of the funniest uh, things I'd ever heard. I was sitting, because they were playing big arenas again. So I was sitting right up the back watching them sound check. And, of course, the, um, the sound people had put all our names on the mics, you know, the front of the mic, so they knew who we were. And I remember <laughs> I heard Kenny Lee, Kenny Lee, because obviously his mic had Enid on it. And he went, Enid? What's an Enid? <laughs> I, just, I, I cracked up. It's, I still can see it now. All those, you know, he just looked, he looked so puzzled. I thought it was one of the funniest things I'd ever heard. <laughs> you had the Runaways, the girl, all girl band with Rush yeah. opening up. You had Girls yeah. School. I guess you were hoping that they track more of women to their shows. I don't know. I'm just. Yeah. I don't know. I, yeah. I've, I've read a thing recently with the Runaways saying that they weren't very nice to them or something. But... Yeah, that was the interview I did with uh, Cherry Curry. <laughs> oh, that was you, was it? Okay, <laughs> of course it was. 
But um, yeah, you pop up a lot, don't you? But anyway, of course. And uh, yeah, but funny thing is, I'm, I'm in touch with Jackie Fox and, you know, people like that. So it's, it's funny because we talk about, you know, bits and pieces over the years. And Did, did, did you, you have know. a more pleasant experience versus the Runaways so-called acclaim? Uh, yeah, 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 they were lovely. And at the end, they gave us a bottle of champagne each. And anybody that gives you a bottle of champagne, well, you know, it's good in our books. Yeah, very nice. Very nice blokes, but still funny because we're we are nothing like Rush and that sort of music I just can't get my head around, you know. So it was just a very odd, very odd experience. But but yeah, it was good. It was really good. good. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious about one thing. Uh what's the life of Kim McAuliffe when she's not on the road? Oh blimey. Um very boring. <laughs> very boring. In fact, yes. Um, no, because obviously I'm a Londoner and I never thought I'd ever leave London. But, you know, I've met somebody that lives up in the country. This, this was 25, six years ago, whenever it was. And um, so I moved out of London and I'm in the countryside now. And I've got massive, I've got, you know, a half eight garden. I've got fields out front. I've got, you know, the little local shop. <laughs> all the, all the uh, you know, the locals, the villagers. You think I'm really weird, but you know, nice. <laughs> and uh, and it's only an hour away from London on the train, so you know I can still get there easy. But uh, yeah, and then of course Denise just followed me up here. She actually lives in the other half house in Harwich, so and I'm in Manning Tree. So um, yeah, we're, we're me and her are still you know close. So yeah, we can't get away. Well, I, you know, we can't get away from each other after fifty years. I say that, you know, I don't know you heard, but on stage, I just go, I think I should, I deserve a medal. <laughs> Good putting, you know, after putting up with her for 50 years. So, but it's a joke, obviously, you know. Yeah. But, uh, One, anyway. each and every rock band that survived for decades mm. uh, have had their ups and downs, especially when it comes to lineup. Was it a hard decision to let go? Your bass player. Which one? <laughs> the last one. <laughs> I'll tell you, uh, yeah. I don't know. Normally people have a problem with drummers. That's the funny thing. We seem to have a problem with bass players. So I, I don't know, you know, just like. But um, obviously Enid and I, the original, you know, we grew up on the same street together. And <clears throat> I've known her all her life. And basically she's only known me all my life except a year because I'm a year older than her. But, yeah, our mum used to put us in the pram together. I mean, she lived at number three and I lived at number 10, Isis Street. So we were literally, so we grew up together and started to play and we formed the band together. And um, so, yeah, so that, so, but, you know, anyway, it's a long story, but whatever. <laughs> you just, just came to, the, to a head where we couldn't carry on anymore. And so that's quite sad. But then, of course, Tracy, our great mate from Rock Goddess, she came back. She's back and forth three times. Then we had Gilly, Gil Weston, who was, you know, whatever. So she was there. Bloody bass players, honestly. And then, <laughs> and then Jackie Carrera, who, who is lovely, still a great mate. So we had her. And then, <laughs> and then Tracy had to leave this time around for personal reasons. It, it's a long story, but her boyfriend, she lives in Spain and he had a bad accident and it was touch and go and she decided she couldn't come to America she had to stay there with him sort of thing and and that all got really emotional so so now we've ended up with Olivia with Olivia Airy who is Don Airy's niece wow I didn't even know. I did not know that didn't know oh well there you go then incredible yeah, she's she's the youngster yeah now the weirdest thing about that is that when we when Enid left all those years ago, well, how many years ago? Oh Christ, no, I've no idea about time. But anyway, um, Malcolm Dome, you remember the late great Malcolm Dome? Mm -hmm. um, he recommended Olivia to us. Uh, but at that point, uh, Tracy had come back. So anyway, um, are you still there? Yep. Yeah, we're here. We're here. We're just. Oh, listening. good. No, it's all right. You froze. That's all right. I'm just going back. So anyway, he he recommended Olivia to us. He said, I've got a perfect, per she's perfect, you know, whatever. And uh, anyway, so of course this time when Tracy went, we just had a number 
and I phoned her up and I went, are you up for it? She went, yeah. And of course, that's it. Two weeks later, she's playing with us. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, as I say, so that's quite, quite funny. Yeah, she comes from a very musical family, obviously. And um, and one of her first gigs, the funniest thing was we, we were doing festivals in, well, our first gig was a festival in Sweden. So mm -hmm. when we had, we were managed to get some sort of rehearsal before that. And then, of course, the next one was Vacken. So she had to play the Vacken with us, <laughs> uh, which was amazing. And then a couple of weeks later, we actually support, this is weird. Oh, God, when, I, when you're talking about best gigs ever, we just played to 60,000 people in Berlin with a band, a German band called D. Arts, D. Arts, D. Arts, or something, yeah, which nobody apart from Germany has ever heard of. And they'd sold out three nights at this aircraft wow. bloody place. And I kept thinking, oh, well, nobody's going to be there to see it. Or the blah, blah, blah. Anyway, it was 60,000 people. And that, that, was, that was poor Olivia's third gig with us. <laughs> <laughs> so she's writing at the deep end, you know, it, it, but she's a, brilliant. She's actually brilliant. That's amazing to hear. Is this yeah. going to be your, are, are, are the years sort of winding down now? Is it going to be less shows, less albums and just yeah. slowly? Well, doing, what's yeah, on the horizon? I, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Cause, and I think it's possibly this, this album is possibly going to be our last one because, um, you know, I mean, if it takes us another eight years to do, I'm going to be 70 odd. So, you know, I'm just, <laughs> no, time to probably time to call it a day when I'm 70, you know. <laughs> I noticed that Jackie Chambers uh, added a dimension to a uh, girl's school that, that really we hadn't seen since uh, Kelly. The bonding between the three of you must be extremely yeah. strong after 25 years in a band. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course, the, the funny thing is, she was always the new girl, but she she's not the new girl anymore. Yeah, Olivia. <laughs> because Olivia's the new girl. Like Ron Wood in the Stones. <laughs> yeah, like exactly. She's lost the status of the new girl. <laughs> but um no, she's all right. She she just loves it, you know, she loves playing and you know the rest of it. So yeah, we got so well. I mean, we got well, I think we've known each other nearly thirty years because, you know, I knew her a few years before she actually joined the band, you know. So yeah, I know. I'll just you know, I don't know about you two, but time for me just, it doesn't exist. I just, I, people ask me, well, when was it when you did that? I went, I've no idea. I don't know. I know I did it, but I've no idea when I did it. <laughs> it's just <laughs> time like time, flies. time yeah, for meaning. Yeah, yeah. Well, On yeah. that note, everybody go yeah. pick up the new album. Well, the latest oh, album, so we'll say. Latest album, you could pick it up. Yeah. It's just as good as the classics. The tour. Yeah, thank you. So you got Girl School, Lillian Axe, and Alcatraz, and our buddy Giles will be on singing for Alcatraz. So uh, that's pretty yeah. cool. The dates again are uh, Dallas, Austin, Portland, Vancouver in Canada, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Phoenix. You could pick up tickets. The tour starts yeah. in two weeks. It starts in two weeks. Oh, so I know. Thanks again. I've got to get myself prepared. I've got to get myself prepared. <laughs> so the set list, the set list, the set list. <laughs> My message, my message to North American fans: I saw that show at Tifofun in Montreal. You do uh, not want to miss it. Uh, Remind you, you, focus on the music because the music yeah. has not aged. It is still as fresh and engaging yeah. and as head banging as it ever was. Well, we still have fun on stage. That's the main thing, you know. Yes. I mean, so it's it's we, we, it's a laugh for us, you know. We just it, we enjoy it and hope that people enjoy it as well. So, you know, but uh, yeah. So I tell you what I'm going to do now is I'm going to get back out in that garden and have a nice cold beer with the other half. So. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on the show again, yeah. Kim. Uh, I don't, we're, we're, probably not gonna, we're probably not going to see you on this tour then I'll take no, it. No, 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 no. We'll have to go to London far. to see you. Yeah. I'll have yeah. to go I'll have to go to Europe and find my yeah. way to say hello. But yeah. I do go to Europe often and, uh, enough. In fact, a couple of years ago I was in Spain and I'm looking at my schedule and I missed you by just a couple of days in uh, in Bilboa and got oh, well. Yeah, yeah. Oh well. 
Okay, well, I was going to say perhaps next time, but I don't know if there will be one. But uh, well, we'll see. You never we'll know. See. I'll make sure people. there is. I'll make sure there is. Okay, all right. We'll never know. Well, it might be a festival or something or two. Exactly. Or, but you know, exactly. basically, never say never. We're not saying it's never ever no, going to happen. It's just it's so never. difficult. It's so bloody difficult. You know. So, but you know, we've 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 got it all together this time. So we'll be there. All right. On that note, thank you so much for your time. Yeah. No, thank you. Thanks for your interest and all that. It's thank fantastic. you, Kim. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for your support. Yeah.